All right, so uh, system design. So I, we just uh, we just talked through, uh, the, we went through the group and uh, trying to ask people what, what they wanted to do and uh, system design is, uh, is something that is generally expected from folks who have a little bit of experience, usually anywhere between like, you know, five plus years of experience. Sometimes it starts as early as three. But if you, are, if you are a junior engineer who's just starting out your career, there is generally no expectation that you understand what system design is. You are expected to be aware of the concepts of what system design is because senior engineers will be doing the design and you should be uh, aware of what the different components are and then essentially be able to meaningfully challenge them and then, uh, and then essentially build something meaningful out of that. So usually at, at someone who's just fresh out of college or not, they would not be expected. But what I've seen is many companies do ask system design questions because just to kind of test your ability to understand different components, how do you decompose them, are you aware of design patterns and things like that. So with that in mind, uh, uh, what, are the, what are the common, what are the kinds of system design questions that folks have actually recently seen? Uh, either in interview setting or in interview preparation setting. Anyone who's actually been working on, go ahead. Like designing an API for a feed. Kind of. Design an API for a feed, uh, a pretty uh, classic interview question because essentially uh, it, it, it works through the same uh, patterns. It works through the same set of uh, question, questioning patterns. Most common design questions usually don't go down to the, the, the API. What they will actually ask for is the, the, the meta problem you're trying to solve. So rather than actually say that design, uh, design an API for like, you know, how do you, dis how do you manage like a friend's graph in, in Facebook, instead of actually asking that question, they would just ask the Uber question, which is like, you know, how do you, how do you actually manage a friend's, friend's graph? And that's it. The expectation is that you need to go and say, I'll build an API. And then they'll say, tell me what the API looks like. But in some cases, they directly ask you the API. And there are a bunch of things that actually come with it. But fantastic. Any other type of questions that people uh, have seen? Define your Netflix. Um, yeah, do a Netflix kind of system that does like video delivery. So build a build a, a full-fledged system with like Netflix, uh, and uh, there are a bunch of uh, problem statements there. One is essentially the catalog management, which is like you know how you manage the catalog, how do you deal with it. Then comes the the recommendation, you know how do you actually connect uh, the items in the catalog to the customer, uh, and then comes the delivery itself, like you know how do you stream it, where do you stream it from, you want to stream from the closest location, you want to be aware of the network conditions that the customer is in and give them the different different pieces and things like that. So there are like multiple ang angles and facets. There is no practical way for you to figure out uh, what the interviewer wants till the interviewer actually tells you. So you probably have to you know fish in the dark a little bit, try to figure out like hey, uh, here's like the big picture and then you want to just narrow it, narrow it down. So, Generally, uh, system design questions are, are, um, are at, at a meta level, they are problem solving questions. You are trying to uh, explain what the problem looks like and then you are trying to build up to, to narrower zones of the problem. So, try not to be super specific in your answer right off the bat. I mean, if you actually start, start saying that I am going to use this specific algorithm to go figure out what is the best way to match customers to this or I am going to use machine learning or big data, whatever else that is, and then you're trying to like zone in on a particular problem and what the interviewer really wanted was actually catalog management. Then you're like nowhere near the picture, so that doesn't work. So, uh, but fantastic, uh, fantastic question, it's a pretty common one. Uh, and any common problem, like uh, from an interviewer perspective, any common problem that you've actually faced uh, is, a, is an interview question, is a system design question. Take it out. For example, elevators. Like I'm, I'm pushing a few buttons on the elevator and I'm like, damn, the elevator doesn't come on time. Now like, fantastic design question. Now tell me how to make the elevator, how to optimize an elevator delivery system or like a way of getting elevators. Or the other one is uh, parking, uh, parking, lot. parking lot. Yeah, parking lot is like, you know, uh, unfortunately parking lot is so overused <laughs> that, uh, that I don't want to actually you know, ask to use that question, but, it's, but there's like so many variants of it that makes it super interesting. So I was once asked a specific question, something like uh, design a telemetry system for that would be common enough for all teams at Microsoft Google mm -hmm. or something. So that's also one type of question. Mm -hmm. So design a telemetry system, which is essentially uh, telemetry systems are systems where you are you're generating large amounts of data and you're just capturing the data and storing them. Uh, in general, the purpose for the telemetry system is, is, is around, uh, is optimized for capturing large amounts of data and storing in, in an organized way. It is not generally, um, it's not generally good for retrieval. It's not generally useful for, uh, like you know, intelligence on top of it. That is a different system. There is a different system. This is a, this is the producer side of the problem. So if you look at uh, like uh, AWS or Azure or any other cloud systems, 
you would actually find that uh, they are dealing with like hundreds of thousands of computers at any point of time. I mean, these are all CPUs, and you're trying to capture data like uh, the the load averages, or in terms of like you know the CPU utilization, memory, uh, disk space utilization. So these are all like you know raw data that actually comes in, and then. Uh, this data is streamed somewhere, so they need to know computer one has a CPU utilization at a five minute granularity of this. And then on top of that you have another system which actually aggregates this data and then figures out like what is the, the average across like a larger time duration. Like you know on an average, like, how many of your computers actually tripped the 80% CPU utilization threshold or things like that. So you have like, a, the, this is like the defining what the metrics are, capturing the data and then finding a system that actually monitors this, these metrics and alarms at various thresholds forms the full system. And at an interviewer perspective, they could just ask one or the full system. Right? So, so that's kind of where we're looking at. Any, any other set of questions? Um, design tiny URL systems. Design tiny URL systems. If I actually go to Google and search for top 10 design questions or design and system design questions, tiny URL actually is pretty much in the number one of the list. And, uh, uh, Tiny URL was, uh, I don't know when Bitly actually started, but it, it was like a, uh, it was a big deal at uh, at some point, and suddenly like, everybody started building their own, like Google has its own, and then uh, I think it looks like Google has sunset its uh, Tiny URL system now. Uh, but everybody has their own. And the other thing of course is with like Twitter and Facebook and others which are like, you know, message based systems, what they've done is they've started to shrink the URLs, which like you have a gigantic long URL that you actually need to post in a Twitter, that doesn't make sense because Twitter is only 280 characters now. So they would shrink the URL into something like, you know, tw dot uh, something, it or something like that, slash uh, uh, hash code, and that generally works very well for them. So uh, that's a very uh, useful um, system. Uh, so it's a very common system design question. So uh, what else? What else? I'm just trying to crowdsource more ideas. And then, One time uh, I had to, uh, for a paper interview thing, it was like design a uh, network rock, paper, scissors kind of game where mm -hmm. you had to like, you know, send the, um, uh, all the different like, you know, things you could do over a network and get them to sync up and stuff. Mm -hmm. So design, uh, so this one's actually interesting. So it's not necessarily a system design question per se, but it actually follows all the same things. So in general, uh, in a system design, you're looking at uh, scale is one of the primary factors for most companies, most items, most most games. For a rock, paper, scissors, it starts with more around, uh, this is here's where it's like it's a near real-time system. So now the, the, the fun part of it is that when you actually merge a near real-time system with scale, it comes up with interesting interesting use cases. So uh, let, let's, say, let's say, instead of like, you know, rock, paper, scissors is one, uh, one angle, but if uh, <clears throat> where there is, it's usually like I, I'm voting for my, my rock, paper, or scissors, and you're voting for yours, as long as, like, we don't have to vote at the same time, as long as my vote is hidden from you and your vote is hidden from me till we actually merge, it's okay. But what about systems where you need to actually um, uh, compete against each other for something? Like at this, at some point of time, I believe when we had uh, domain names, which were being, like, they started like a new domain name, that uh, <coughs> new domain name, uh, sub top level domain or something else and they wanted people to actually come and buy and when you want when you go buy for these things but the challenge that happens is that um, is that you've got like a million people coming and hitting the, the website at the same time and you need to be scaled for that and that makes it harder so what they did instead was they actually uh, brought in like a reservation kind of a system where you could reserve a spot and then what they would do is that they would actually you know make you compete at that point of time, you can go buy, and then from the time, so I give you a slot between 10 and 10, 10, and you have to come in and buy. So however much time you have taken between 10 and 10, 10 is your your time. And then you will compete against, like she gets 11 o'clock spot, and whatever time she took between 11 and 11, 10 is her time. Between the two of you, whoever is faster gets the domain, or something like that. So they actually did this is like a digital archery, apparently, of where they make you compete, and the whole idea is to actually make you, uh, uh, like separate or spread out the load. A large part of most common, uh, like you know, uh, sale and things like that, is where you are. Um, you have people hitting. Like if you have like Amazon Prime Day sales, this Black Friday, Thanksgiving sales, or Christmas shopping, right? All of those places at midnight something goes on sale, and you have like a limited products, like ten thousand products are available. And that's it, and you've got like a million people trying to buy that. So what's going to happen is about a couple of seconds before you're going to have people refresh multiple times and that causes issues. So, so there are like few strategies you can use to spread that load around, like digital archery and whatnot. 
So, so we'll get back. We'll get back to the the main thing. So, but the the bigger part of the story is that uh, most of these system design questions generally involve either scale or timing and synchronization and trying to figure out what is the what is the catch and. Uh, and then there's also elements of, uh, of security which comes in in terms of like, you know, how do you trust, whom do you trust and when do you trust them? So there is an element of identity. I need to know who's actually making this request, why are they making it and uh, are they the right setup in terms of making, making things work. Now, uh, in terms of like broad system design questions, every, every question has its own, uh, its own sets of, of what you do. So we'll probably have to pick one. So uh, what I'll what I'll walk through is um, so one of the things that actually was was uh, intriguing me in the last few days, and I haven't actually spent enough time to break it down, but I think I'm going to use this group to figure out how to break it down. Is uh, so I'm actually working. I'm uh, I am using a rideshare system, and this is not the Ubers or the Lyfts, but this is uh, this is Scoop. So if you haven't used Scoop, you may not know, but essentially it's a system where you can choose to be a driver or you can choose to be a rider, right? But it's it's much like Uber. But in the case of Uber, it's an on-demand ride-sharing system. But here, it, this is not on-demand. This one is actually pre-scheduled. So this is for uh, matching carpool uh, drivers, like drivers with riders, for their daily commute to work. So essentially, what they're doing is that you specify, this is my home, this is my place of work, and I'm going to be traveling between 9 and 9.30 from my house to the work. So I'll start between 9 and 9.30, I'll reach between 10 and 10.30, or something like that. And then you as a rider would say, I want, this is my home, this is my place of work, I would like to reach my destination at this particular point of time and I'd like to start between like you know 9 and 9.30. So if my route matches your route or my origin, origin and destination matches you, then I would match you. And then essentially uh, the scoop has some monetary elements to it, so it will take like $5 from you, give this person $5 and I think they grab a commission on both sides, so they take 7 from you and like the six plus one and then they give you six minus one to you, they make two dollars in the process and that's how they, they make money. But, uh, it's a weird, it's a weird uh, <laughs> All right, so that's how they make money. So now the, the, the uh, what I'm saying is, what, what I wanna do is I wanna build this ride sharing. Like I wanna build this matching, ride matching system. So, uh, any questions? So, in, in a design, system design question, the number one uh, like rule or number one thing is that from an interviewer perspective, I would like to leave the question purposefully vague and ambiguous. Why? Why, why? why do I keep the question vague or ambiguous? So that the candidate can ask more questions. So that the interviewer, the candidate can ask you more questions and clarifications. In a real world scenario, seldom is the, are the parameters well known. Like I don't, I can't. It's not a question of where I'm actually saying that, you know, this is how you calculate prime numbers and give me the 15th prime number, right? I mean, that's a very specific question. There's only one answer, that's how it works. In a system, uh, when you're trying to engineer a system, the requirements are not very clear. The, even though I kind of know what I want and uh, I can probably very happily describe the happy path in a system, like, you know, this is what happens, but I can't define the, the, the corner cases, like you know, uh, what if I if I'm supposed to, if I have a neighbor who's like you know 10 feet who stays like 20 feet from where I stay, and uh, his his office is in like one floor below, below where my office is, then fantastic, the right share matches. But now the question comes in terms of like what if this uh, the neighbor is like it's not neighbor, it's a little far away. What happens if the office is elsewhere? What happens if the times are off and things like that, right? So there's a lot of other edge cases. What is the tolerance? How do you want to match? I mean, there are like too many questions around that. If it's a perfect match, exact thing, it's very easy, right? So that's the, so what I am describing is the happy case. Now what I need you to focus on is essentially first is to make sure that you understand the happy case. And the second thing is to start working around the corners and see what the question, what, what else you want to do. Uh, in many cases, these are questions. In some cases, it's actually assumptions. So you're gonna make an assumption saying, I'm gonna match you with someone in the same city. Or I'm gonna match you with someone who's like within a one mile radius of where you are. Just make an assumption and move on, it's not that hard. And then, uh, and then you can, or if you are like if you're trying to be crazy, you can also start saying, I'll try to match someone who's as close as you, but like, you know, less than a particular radius, but then I'm going to keep, I'll, I'll prefer matching you to someone who's close by, I'm going to optimize for the total right time. I mean, you can do a lot of these weird things if you want to, but I think you, uh, it's much easier and simpler to just start with some assumption, and then you can, you can kind of keep building on top of that. So. With this vague question, the first step, our first order of business is asking more questions. So, uh, what, what, what questions do you have? Mm -hmm. 
Go ahead. What's the average number of users you are going to expect at a point in time? Why is that relevant? It's a good question. Why is that relevant? Um, that's going to determine the load the system is going to receive. Correct. So, um, and will that does, will that change what you're designing? Like, if I were to say it's like yeah, it's going to be 50 users because I'm doing it for like this meetup, right? right? So we have this meetup at different places. All I'm trying to do is essentially what did I do in Slack? I just put up a question saying, hey, how many of you want to do this? I said like, are you carpooling from here or there? So that's it, right? The destinations are fixed, timing is fixed, and let's go for it. So that's like, we're talking about like what, 20 users and that's yeah, it? Yeah. Or we're talking about like a, a Seattle-wide initiative, which is what and San Francisco, Seattle and whatnot, which is what Scoop is, which is probably like 50,000 is their target audience. Or you may want to actually say, no, it's not like just this, but it's probably like an event carpooling system. So it's the game in, in, uh, in the stadiums. So now we're talking about like 100,000 people for just one specific event. So I understand scale makes a difference. The, the question that you want to ask yourself is, uh, is that what part of the puzzle are you trying to solve and what logical assumptions can you make? So here in this particular, my take on it based on what I just described as the office commute system, whether it's 50 people or 500 people or 5,000 people, your, your system, fundamentally you're not going to choose to do like a relational system versus a NoSQL system based on that. So your, the scale is, is something that happens immediately after. You may want to like tiny URL is, is another example, right? If I were to say tiny URL and say what's the scale, like I'm talking about 100,000 URLs, then of course I'm going to change my design right off the bat. So think whether that question is going to have a material impact on the design. So in this particular case, I actually am not sure if I would ask the scale question. Okay. It is relevant, but I would probably make an assumption which is somewhere down the middle of the line and just call it a day. But, but go ahead, but that, that's a, it's a great question to ask for different types of system design questions, but probably not as relevant for this one is how I would look at it. But again, no harm in asking. Uh, and, and it could be as simple as an answer like, yeah, I have 5,000 users, go on. The interviewer may not even make a big deal out of it. And, uh, <clears throat> but as a, in my interviews, I would probably ask you that question. Say, why is that relevant? How is that going to change your design? Because my goal is not to design the system, my goal is to understand how you're thinking about design. So sometimes interviewers actually focus on too much on the solution, not the candidate's uh, design practices. So they may not actually use this as an opportunity to dive deep, but, but that's where I am. Okay? So, but good question. Sorry, I didn't mean to. So is the driver or the rider given priority as to like arriving at the destination time? Fantastic. So that's a that's a good question because it fundamentally changes your approach. You're like a driver first or, or a rider first, and then uh, while it doesn't significantly change your algorithm, but it actually changes the vocabulary. Like you know how you're talking to me as an interviewer. You're actually saying you know I'm going to start with the driver, find all the drivers, and then find riders that match the drivers, and I'm going to deal with it. Or I'm going to say I'm going to find all the riders, and I'm going to find the drivers that can actually potentially work and find the best driver and match. So. From an algorithm standpoint, both algorithms are not very different. You're like matching A to B or B to A. It should be the symmetric algorithms to a large extent because the constraints look very similar. But as, a, as an interviewer, if I have one paradigm in my mind and as a candidate you have another paradigm in your mind, we both will be like at odds because I'll misunderstand what you're saying and, and things like that. So in many, many cases for, for matching questions, typically for where you're looking at uh, uh, matching Riders like buddies and whatnot, or you know, trying to match like coach to coachy, mentor to mentee, or like you know, matching uh, or general, general sort of like matching algorithms, like you know, trying to find bins to fit the box in, right? Now you need to know, can I do I find a bin and then find boxes that can fit into it, or do I find the boxes and find bins that can fit the box, right? The, the match algorithm is is roughly the same. I mean, it's the same algorithm, but you just know where you need to come from. Uh, explicitly stating what it is and the vocabulary that you use and how the paradigm that you're in, it helps to align the paradigm with the interviewer's paradigm. It just goes much smoother. Most interviewers are able to align to what your paradigm is. So not asking this question is not a not it's not like a the, it's, not, it's not a very it's not a deadly sin per se. But if you ask it, it's a very fantastic. Question. So great question. So absolutely. So in this case, I'm actually going to say uh, drivers are the king. I mean, we have fewer drivers. And we have uh, a lot more, uh, like you know, carpoolers. So I would prefer drivers in this particular case. I can easily say that since the riders are the ones who are paying, they are the customers, and that and the drivers are the ones who are getting money for the, for this carpool. 
So I can easily pivot this around, like you know, a Uber-like system actually optimizes for the riders, not for the drivers. They actually make the drivers go extra miles to go pick up a ride, right? Because they are optimizing for more ridership because the more the riders, the more the money they make, and, and that's what it is. So here, the this is more of a carpool system. So I am actually not driving for money. I'm just driving, and my only intention, the reason why I use this system, is that I can use the I-90 carpool lane. Like if I have a carpool buddy, uh, my friend who lives like a, a mile away or two miles away, I'm just going to go pick him up. I'm not going to use Scoop at all. My goal is to, like, I, I reach faster if I have somebody with me. I reach much slower if I don't have someone with me. So I would love to use, I, I would love to use uh, the Scoop system to help me. You know, I'm trying to optimize. It's the, the six bucks or seven bucks that I get is not really a big deal in that particular case. So, given that perspective, for me. Getting someone meaningful is useful. If that means I have to go 20 minutes away to save like 10 minutes, it's useless for me. So my met metric is time, not money. So it becomes a little different. But but fantastic question. So in this case, I would like to uh, I would like to believe that uh, and this is my system. So I'm going to say that uh, yes, I'm going to optimize for driver comfort. So if it doesn't match, if the driver is not matching the, I would much rather not match someone which is actually a painful match uh, than to actually match. From a rider standpoint, from a for a from a driver standpoint, from a rider standpoint, it doesn't matter. Right? I get I get picked up where I want to. I get dropped where I want to. So I don't. It, there's no pain for the rider if you match me with someone who is not right. So anyway, what else? Maybe like authentication, so that we can figure out like uh, people can register to the system, who is driver, like who is rider, and maybe like uh, how mm -hmm. many people a driver can take. Maybe like mm -hmm. four people or like three people. So. Fantastic point. So uh, you, you, you rattled out a few different things. So I want to make sure we cover all of them, right? So first one is authentication. How do you actually make sure that who's the rider, who's the driver? How do you make sure that the rider is, is really fit to ride? How do you make sure the driver is fit to ride? And things like that. Uh, absolutely important. Uh, why do you want to talk through that? It, it doesn't significantly change the design in terms of like you know the, the fundamental question that I, at least where I'm gravitating towards is the matching algorithm. So the fact that they are actually, you know, approved riders, approved drivers, do you have a driver's license, do you actually own a car, is it insured, all of those things are actually, to, in my mind, uh, they are important, but not germane to the question that we are actually looking at. But that being said, uh, I am glad that you are actually thinking about security, I am glad you are thinking about like the, the other frills of the system the interface. So it definitely makes sense to talk about, uh, I am going to make an assumption that there is going to be like an authentication mechanism, so we somehow know how to figure it out. I am going to make an assumption that somehow you are going to figure out that these riders are really riders and, uh, and these drivers are really drivers, because if you have like cancellations at different points, it is going to be a problem. Like, you know, if I am building a marketplace where I am trying, uh, like a flea market, right? Design a system like an online marketplace system where people can eBay, where people can come and sell, people can come and buy. How am I making sure that the, the sellers are actually you know genuine? How do, how do I make sure that I'm offering uh, security and comfort to the buyers when they're trying to do that? So those questions are important, but they may not they and each of them will specifically form a separate interview, like you know design question or a separate module and a big workflow. So Scoop, what it does actually in real life is that it actually it asks for your driver's license. And it pulls your driving record from the from the DMV or whatever, and then based on uh, I think they use some uh, third-party uh, identity verification agency or something like that, so that verifies your name, age, date of birth, driving record, driving history, and whatever else, and then they decide whether they approve you or not. And it's like a I'm, I'm assuming they pay like a dollar or two for each or something like that. Uh, should we like clarify the match process, like? Uh like for example, if they're I'll come to that. Let me complete his, 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 his. You talk about a few other things. So let me close that. I'll come back to that. That's actually a pretty good. Uh, that is the, that is where I want to go as well. So so you talked about identity. So that is actually great. Uh, the second thing you uh, I missed for the second thing you, you you talked about three things in total. Uh, there was one about this. The second one was was about um, uh, who's there to ride it? How many how many people? how many people can ride in the in the, with the driver? Like you know, is it like do I have a van that I can take six people? Or do I have a car that can only take three, or should I just do? You know what? I'm just going to match one to one. I'm never going to. I don't care about it. Like carpool buddy is just a buddy, because I, it's not a it's not a Uber ride share system or like and it's not a Uber pool or something where I'm like trying to optimize for more ridership. I'm just optimizing for pairing of people so that I can just you know reduce the carbon footprint per se, right? So that's my goal. Uh, but but the meta point there is essentially you're trying to come up with like you know. What is the what are the abstract configuration details that need to be associated with both the rider and the driver so that I can use that in my algorithm later to see if I need to match multiple people or not? 
and uh, is it just metadata like you know what color is your car what type of car is it what's the license number so that like you know car your license ending one two three four so that i can how do i how do how does the rider visually identify this so the the thing that that these things tell me is that so the the interview answer is think of it as a meta point of having an abstract configuration associated with the rider and driver so that it can be used just purely for for purposes which are like display and other things uh, photograph your uh, you know your profile picture or something else that is one and the second thing is essentially it is data like where are you where is your office where is your where is your what type of car is it can you take multiple people or what is your preference do you want to take only one person or do you want to take multiple i i have a i don't know i have a bus but i only want one more person because i don't care I and mean, i don't want to actually waste my time i just one person is enough for me to take the carpool lane and that's all i want or it's a different carpool lane which requires two people so i don't want to take one person because taking one person is useless to me right if the carpool lanes only let me drive if i have three people then just taking one extra buddy doesn't really help my my cause so what's my preference like what's the minimum number of riders i need and what's the maximum number of riders i need so these are all configurations that will go on a affect the algorithm that you're talking about right so so the the, the meta point here is grab that abstract configuration and then start, try to kind of walk through saying i'm going to have a bunch of things that are configuration and then i'll use it so you're trying to define the objects and entities in that in that particular form but fantastic uh, set of it, this is all about system design is all about how organized you are with asking questions with Uh, collecting the data that you need and then essentially logically breaking it down into algorithms and operations right so that's what we'll get to uh, you had something uh, yeah the so i don't know if you already touched upon this uh, it's about uh, is it scheduled or is it on the fly like real time booking or was it scheduled fantastic question my question set up was that this is for car this is carpool for work so and it's actually set well in advance so this is not competing with ubers of the world primarily because uber is an on demand ride share system whereas the carpool buddy system is essentially where I, at for scoop at 9 pm i need to tell them what i'm doing like you know when am i driving tomorrow morning and at 3 pm i'm actually telling them before 3 i'm telling them when i'm driving uh, on my evening commute and that's between and i can pick any time between 4 pm to 7 pm and for from between like you know 7 am to something like that so typically the idea is that everybody puts in their request the previous day the system has a whole lot of time to figure out like you know whom to match with what and then in about uh, an hour or two like in you know, about about 10 pm or 10:30 pm they actually let us know what's going on and they let the drivers and the riders like cancel or opt out by uh, the morning so if you like 7 am you can just say no i don't want to good point good um so do we know anything about the area we're designing for like if it's a rural versus city because the roads you know if you're in a city there might be a lot more variation in paths versus kind of a rural area which would affect the optimization when you're doing like pathfinding fantastic so would you want to would you want to actually add that as a as a configuration parameter for your uh, for your optimization system or is this question um, relevant enough for you to uh, is it a question that's a part of your decision tree as you're designing the system or is it a, is it just metadata that will help you figure out what uh, later i guess that be pretty algorithm specific it's very algorithm specific so to me it's just data for the algorithm okay. so <clears throat> there are two types of questions you can ask in an interview right one is essentially which is like a, it's a decision tree question saying well, what are you optimizing for are you optimizing for this or optimizing for this what are you trying to get to are you trying to do this or trying to do that because that helps you in the selection of the algorithm that helps you in like the the, the bigger blocks of the system those are the questions you want to ask in interview the second types of questions are actually questions which are like data oriented questions or metadata like should i capture the color of the car and show to the rider like sure doesn't affect the algorithm doesn't affect much i mean the and uh, so so the the thing is like you know you might want to ask is it like a mobile app or a web app because that actually makes a fundamental difference to how you are actually thinking about organizing it is it uh, is it like peer to peer system or is it a server driven system like uh, whatsapp for example is a peer to peer messaging system to to some extent i mean it is still uses a central server but no data is actually centrally stored all the data is actually exchanged uh, from peer to peer directly through a central server so those questions make a difference in terms of how you choose to organize your system so now let's come to the main main core main part of the question which is uh let's clarify the matches like how we define that two people <coughs> have the same destination like for example if they are like one mile away they are still match or like something like that mm -hmm. so the, the the if i if i go to the breadth of the question right in terms of 
how do I actually capture the data from the customers? Like in terms of like, you know, how do you tell me that you want to be matched, right? Then how do I actually match people? How do I let people know that they have been matched? And how do I let people like, you know, express their approval, disapproval, I don't like this, disapproval, I don't like this, I want to, uh, I don't want, don't match me with this guy ever again or something else, I mean, things like this, right? Or this route is terrible, I never want to take that exit ever, and things like that, right? So how do you actually tweak, get data from the customers back to tweak your algorithm? But if I look at the entire thing, right, to me, the, the IP and the design and everything is sort of in the, in the in algorithm, like how do you, the, the matching algorithm, that's how, that's what it looks like. The reason, this question, given the number of people that are looking at, and given the fact that the, the matching algorithm is also reasonably offline, as in it takes, you can take a couple of hours for you to figure out what the matches are. I mean, it could actually be, uh, I don't know, printouts going to somebody in this, like, this human powered matching system, and then they're like keying in something and sending back, I mean, hope not. But it could be that too. So it could, there could be, or like, there could be an automatic generated matching system, which a human just reviews and approves, and then, you know, decides to do some tweaks or something like that. So if any of those systems happen, so it's reasonably clear that scale may not be a driver for this system, at least at this point of time, based on what we're looking at. So the matching algorithm becomes the crux of the story. So how are you matching? What are the parameters you're matching? And then it becomes a very simplistic, uh, tell me the rules for the matching and, and we'll make it work. Like, you know, uh, and we'll, we'll deal with that. So what, what we'll do right now is I want to take a, uh, I want to pause here. Uh, let people actually divide yourselves in groups of like three, maybe four people and, uh, and have a conversation around what the design looks like, uh, in terms of what it is, what, what, would, what would you think as the, the matching algorithm, and then let's come back and then, uh, and then have a discussion on what, what specifically the matching algorithm would look like and what kind of uh, inputs we want to take from the user for the matching algorithm. Right? So let's take a break, turn around, uh, folks around, form, form groups of three or four, start discussing uh, what do you think. All right? now introduce yourself. All right, thank you. <coughs> All right, so what we we'll do is uh, good discussions. <laughs> All right, so what we'll do is let's get back together as a group and uh, as a class, and then let's actually discuss what you guys have been individually discussing, independently discussing. I think great discussion. I think I see a lot of uh, good uh, the vocal arguments, pushback. So this is exactly what happens in a system design question. The, the question is vague enough, but at the same time, this is this is a very simplistic problem, right? It's a problem that that is pretty common. Once somebody has actually articulated what the problem statement looks like, we know what we're trying to do. On a, on a similar note, right? In a in a typical environment, what we see is that you will find a business problem that is that requires solving, and uh, the parameters are somewhat no, not really clear, and the companies are actually trying to solve for that question. And, and that's what happens, right? You uh, get together with your peers and then you discuss the question and then you come up with an answer that actually makes some sense. You are making assumptions and uh, pretty, um, I almost guarantee that most of your assumptions are wrong. They're not precise, they're not perfect, they're like somewhere in the ballpark. And, uh, and you just have to refine that. So, so one of the uh, few good things to always think of in design is, is to make sure that you have a way of iterating over your design. So your, your assumptions have to, they cannot be, um, uh, like, you know, they cannot be a fixed assumption that cannot be changed later. So if you were to choose not to do something, it needs to be real hard. Like for example, if I choose not to store the data for something, then the problem is that if you need the data later, you don't have it. But at the same time, if you're on the other hand, if you say, I'm gonna choose to store every little thing, I'm gonna store the phone model, version number, and the microsecond that the customer said okay for, I'm not sure if that's necessary, right? So, so you, may have, you may have to strike a balance about what, could, what you need right now, which is the minimum, absolute minimum required data. What you might need in the future, you might want to make some reasonable guesses there. And clearly be sure, like, you know, there's no, no sense in preserving some sense of data and trying to cut it out. Because very soon, you're, the volume of data you're, you're dealing with is going to be unwieldy. So you can't just store everything. 
All right, so let's walk through different groups and see what, what are the key things that you guys discuss. So why don't we start with this group here. What, what were the key things that you were discussing? So the key things were discussed was like um, on the SQL database side, do, what type of SQL uh, data we would be storing? Is it like more relational? Mm -hmm. Or um, you want to store like uh, in, a non, uh, in a more modern type of SQL storage, mm -hmm. like no SQL databases mm -hmm. and stuff. And we went with like, you know, the traditional SQL database is good enough for this solution because we want to maintain that driver and uh, rider relationship in the database. And we are not looking at like very fast retrievers given that it's like we are scheduling this process way ahead of time. Mm -hmm. um, so we don't need this uh, data to be like very real time and very robust in the sense. Mm -hmm. So we would go with like uh, SQL database on the back end. Mm -hmm. um, and we would also uh, make sure, like after that ride is complete, we will, so we call this as the uh, ride table. So after the ride is complete, we will clean up the data and by clean up, we will probably put the uh, in some low cost persistent TV so that in case in future, For if analytics, some you might want to issue it. or analytics or if government wants you to tell who went on a ride with mm -hmm. whom or whatever, right? So your so morning so ride share that you paired up with is irrelevant for anything else? Just because you and I were carpooled in the morning doesn't mean much. Uh, uh, except it, when when you when I say I don't want to ride with you or you say you don't want to ride with me, I want to persist that as a preference. But otherwise, the fact that we carpooled or we stored is not useful it, it for could, It could still be important if say the person got murdered or something and they want to know. They were sure. like, 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 <laughs> For example, sure. like, for legal reasons the reasons apps, like you have, like, so that federal federal requirements. Requirements. you just dump it in for some For odd reasons, you, you might want to know what happened, who, how, because at some point, I, since I'm taking money from you and I'm paying money, I'd like to keep track of like, you know, you got paid for taking yeah. this person and you got paid from this person, right? So there's always a trail that you have to have so that yeah. things happen, you need to you need to account for. But in, in most cases, all, all I'm but saying is that the matching algorithm may not depend on the data from prior yeah. in, in yeah. some cases. Yeah. But uh, And we also case. need like a feedback back from the rider after the ride is over. Like as you said, the way if it was a good ride or whatever and we need to persist that as well. And so we thought we'll have a separate users table and have uh, user specific information put in that mm -hmm. and persisted over time. How quickly did you jump to SQL as a data storage and why was that even a conversation? Because I could have easily expected it was like a 20 minute chat between the time we actually broke into groups and that. So and you could have easily discussed a whole bunch of other things and not focused on is it Java versus ASP versus PHP, right? I mean, those are implementation and tooling choices which are so deep, low, down low in the priority list of your discussions that uh, how, how quickly were you actually jumping into that one? Uh, I'm just curious, I'm not poking <laughs> at your solution as such, but go ahead. Um, I guess we only talked about that. I didn't know why we didn't talk about the language we might use. Uh -oh. It didn't seem relevant. Like, at the end you, yeah. Whether it's a PHP or a Java or ASP is, is almost like you know, is irrelevant in this particular context. I mean, um, And also I've worked for five years and I've designed systems, so I guess. So you, so you jumped over to SQL and my, I know SQL design because you thought that was relevant but not the language of, not, not language choice. Yeah. Uh, did you debate between which type of like relational versus non-relational you discussed but did you actually choose which flavor of SQL would you use whether it is uh, like a, a MySQL versus a, a T-SQL. I don't have that much knowledge into DB to dive into that. Um, so she was the one who brought up the uh, different kind of databases and pros and cons for it so I was like Did you focus on what indices, indices would you have? Uh, what's yeah, your we didn't go into the scheme of the table. We didn't go in depth of like what SQL do we need. Like the question was like more like, do you want to support like data robustly or do you want to like? Where is it coming from, right? Now, what what's your requirement, right? So fantastic. So and the requirements like we dealt like we also discussed some important key things about the requirement. Like you have like drivers and like uh, riders, and uh, main thing is like understanding the system. So drivers are um, initial analysis was requirement analysis was drivers would like see a filter screen and um, uh, they would like look for filters like you know I want someone um, within like 0.5 uh, mile radius distance for pick up and drop off and then they would have like timings like during this time or mm -hmm. uh, I, I will like pick up the uh, riders and number of riders I want to pick up to, to qualify for a, a carpool lane and stuff. And drivers um, and um, riders would get like notifications saying that hey, this driver wants to pick you up. Are you fine with this? And then they will accept those. And it's like more um, like again a messaging kind of system to like uh, you so have the one. Actual driver. system doesn't have the, the ability to accept. You have the ability to reject, but not accept. 
in the sense that it's assigned to you. Mm -hmm. You can you can essentially you know silence is acceptance because that's what they want, and then if you reject, they will that's it. You're not matched with anybody for that day, and then you're only allowed some number of cancellations per month because you like you don't get a choice too much, and and you you could say why, and then they would kind of like you know waive your penalty for that because if they they completely give you a horrible route and then you say no, I don't want it. Uh, it doesn't count towards you because it's a horrible route and then they'll try to fix that problem. So they're trying to be fair, but at the same time adding process in the in this uh, approvals and whatnot will only make it harder because you're not trying to, you're not, this is not a long lived process, right? It's just a one day process. At 9 p.m. they have to match you for 8 a.m. right? So how many opportunities do you have to interact with the, with the customer? Yeah, we to don't go get back their approvals. You can't do back and forth at all. So that's why you provide your preferences, you provide your preferences, we match them. We're kind of doing something similar for our uh, the study group pilot that we have right now, right? So, <laughs> so we are uh, so we are running a study group, and uh, for the study group, what we what we're saying is that we've actually put a uh, we've sent out a Google Forms where people are actually saying, um, "I my name is this, this is my email address because that's what I need to kind of connect you with," and then um, my interest is I'm okay with a weekday evening. Weekend morning. I mean, I'm not even giving you specific times. It's like you know, weekday evening is essentially 7 p.m. to 11 p.m. and weekend a week. Uh, no, I think it's 8 to 12, 8 to whatever, like uh, 6 to 9 or 10 or something. Weekend mornings and weekend evenings are the three choices you can pick, and you can pick as many as you want because then I can pair you up with somebody. So for the leads, they do the exact same thing. We match them up and we pick leads and then we say that's it. Do you want in-person class or do you want an online class is a question because uh, uh, predominantly a lot of folks are actually Seattle oriented. So we have been able to, so I've, I actually did this manually over the last couple of days and uh, and what I found was essentially I could run one group which is in-person. Uh, with We've got like six people who are interested, actually seven people are interested in teaching, in learning and uh, three people are interested in teaching. Unfortunately, I want two teachers. so. I can only make one group out of it. So I manually did that activity. So now what I'm saying is I, I, I wish I had a way, this could be like automated where you just provide your requests from two different parties. We have a very simplistic algorithm that matches. You don't have any preference in this case. Like you as a student, you as a teacher, no preference. I mean, you, you said my dates and times, but you can't say, no, I don't want to work with him or I don't want to work with her. It's not something that you have a choice. I mean, I don't have that level of granularity or that level of touch that we have the option to. I mean, if you don't like it, you can drop out of the group. If you don't want to teach this group, you can drop out or something like that. I mean, that's all you can do right now. Uh, which is which is what the system is also. You don't like the route, you don't like the pairing, you don't want to do this. No, uh, in, in some scenarios, it's like, you know, I know I want to be, uh, I want to go towards that and I want to match. I want to, I can only leave at nine. I can't leave before that. Sometimes it will come back and say, oh, leave at 8.30, go pick this person up. No, sorry, cancel. I mean, I can't leave before nine. That's, that's my constraint. So anyway. So let's actually go to other groups and see what they have and what about you guys, what did you discuss? So the, uh, we started with uh, some preference basically what, what things we want to uh, collect from user, from the driver and rider. Mm -hmm. So essentially driver says that I, this is my start range and end range and driver knows that route so he will say that if I start between 9 to 9.30 I will reach between 10 to 10.30. Mm -hmm. So he knows because he always drives that way. Now only thing he can say is that, oh, I can pick up anybody within two mile radius. Okay. Now, one more question came up saying that, is it only the starting? Uh, he can pick it up on the way also because there is sometime uh, when you start, you don't find the rider is going to the same place. So it might be that on the way also, if somebody within a two mile detour, I can go pick them up and if it matches the destination. That's like, you're, 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 like you're poking at the, at the algorithm of, opt, of the yeah. route matching algorithm, which is fantastic. Because at the, at the end of the day, the route matching algorithm is ultra complex. Mm -hmm. And I don't think there is, I don't think it is reasonable to expect anybody, uh, unless that's what you've done, like you've done a PhD thesis on it or something, to anybody to expect to be able to meaningfully come up with like, you, you can do the naive approach. You can say, you know what, I'm going to match this, I'm going to do miles, I'm going to do kilometers or whatever and then make it work, right? That's set. Apart from the rudimentary algorithm elements and apart from the fact that you have awareness of collecting data, it's very hard for me to expect you to come up with like the optimal algorithm which actually picks the rural versus city versus like, you know, those are all like input points. The fact that you recognize that there are differences is, is important to me. The fact that you're able to come up with the most optimal algorithm is, is very hard. So, but these are all like inputs to me to say that, yeah, I know how you're thinking, which is good. Go on. Uh, then the other question is, what uh, uh, 
as a passenger or rider, what is my preference? Uh, is it my preference is to pick up timing or uh, because most of the time I want to reach at before 10. Yeah. So well, my login time is 10. I need yeah. to be at work at 10. I don't care if I need to leave so, at 8 or 5 or 2. But then time. another thing is that I don't want to start at 7 because I want to reach at 10. Mm -hmm. uh, so they will say that this is the time I have to reach but I can start between any time you know after this because I don't want to start at 7 but so scoop actually so, only for fixes on the start time not the end time okay so the way that which is fine I mean it, it's a decision so okay. they, they don't they optimize for the start time not the end time and uh, essentially they're saying that you should figure out based on the the condition prevailing conditions because then as far as start time is concerned, I can kind of guarantee the start time a lot more mm -hmm. than I can guarantee the end time. I have no idea what kind of traffic you will face, yeah. what kind of like, what if there's an accident, what if there's a sudden detour. I can't predict that. So it's a little, uh, I don't want to take on that liability. Okay. And I don't want you to come and complain that you did that. So that's, I'm assuming that's why I scooped with this. So they did a, a start time for the morning and the evening rides in terms of a range. So they would actually say, I want to start at 8.15, that's it. Or I want to start between 8.15 and 9.15 and that's mm -hmm. it. So they're trying to do, that's how they're trying to do it. Whereas uh, there's a, there are different systems which actually, I, I can easily envision a system where you do the other way around, where you do the end time based. Yeah. No. We were taking like four different alternatives there for the preferential system. You could actually say, I want yeah, start, start, I want end, end, I want both, yeah. Yeah. I, don't, I don't care about either. So. Yeah. Or, or also like the, the start radius and the destination radius also as a, as a preference. Oh, so nice. Like, hey, I definitely not go, I, I don't want to be in Seattle traffic and then roam around like the city limits were so and so. Mm -hmm. So I would prefer to stick within like say a mile of my destination. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Interesting, so, right? So let's let's see what what about the what about the group in the back? What do you guys discuss? We were discussing a few different ways for the algorithm itself. Mm -hmm. uh, so he came up with the KNN clustering mm -hmm. to figure out uh, how close is the start and the so the, basically reducing the space size of it, telling from a whole big of problem, try to get to zero or closer to the start point and towards the end point. And there was a solution made on how you can use BFS on top of that to figure out the, the parts that you want to try to pick for people. So that's a potential direction the interview can go. So if you have like the algorithm knowledge, and if the interviewer also is familiar with KNN and and, uh, and wants to explore a little bit more, he or she can actually continue the same line of questioning and get a lot more details out of it. And your interview goes from like a Uber system design. Yep, yeah, I know what you're talking about to uh, a descriptive algorithm and then like you know poking the poking at the edges of that and then trying to practically map uh, an algorithm to a real world problem which is like a, it was a lot more powerful data uh, but from a system design interview perspective i want to make sure that i'm covering all the not just like you know have you done the do you know what the inputs are do you know what the outputs are do you have a, a, an understanding of like the the block diagram for the process and then somebody else is going to go implement the process and I could spend time looking at the process. So fantastic. So I was actually looking for or hoping that at least one of the groups will go down to the algorithm. So it looks like somebody has. Go on. And uh, there were a bunch of more questions in the region we all had. I think they just go along and ask these questions which we had. Yeah, so uh, we were trying, one thing we were trying to clarify is, uh, is it, are the destinations, of, are, is it always the same place or do you say it can be a destination for a rider, can be along the driver's route anywhere along it. Mm -hmm. So much like pick up, so you're talking about destination, it's the same thing, right? So if I'm riding from Sammamish to Seattle, can I actually pick someone from Issaquah, which is somewhere in between, and then drop them at Bellevue, which is also on I-90, uh, and do I really have, can I do that and still call it a match instead of me having to necessarily pick someone at Sammamish, my neighbor, and then drop him like one floor, uh, below where I'm working, right? But that's not necessarily the case. So, fantastic. So, it's more like poking at the edges of what the algorithm looks like. The other question was uh, how, so, it's like the end location should be the same probably for the, I don't know the carpool system where you're all going to the same location. So, even if you're going to pick somebody up, the other thing that came up was that people should walk to that particular location where you, considering it's the same route that happens, like uh, a bank or something, then you can say that you know what, you, I will go to these places and this is where people walk in. Mm -hmm. But if different people are getting matched on different days to the same route and they are all coming from like slightly different places and not how this whole thing will work or the same car can go to different locations. Right. I, mean, no, I, mean, I think it's a, it's a, so now this is not an algorithm side of the story right. but this is more on the practical aspects of the thing, right? So in uh, in in uh, Uber, uh, at least uh, Uber has this thing for calling Uber. Or, uh, Uber, it is Uber. So Uber has the Uber Express. 
for pool for the, the Uber uh, pool, and then there's also like a Uber normal pool. And the Uber normal pool essentially will drop you wherever you ask them to, but Uber Express actually has like a, a, a line defined, and they you can expect to walk anywhere between like 10 to 15 minutes to reach your destination or to reach the pickup point. So they would actually give you like, you know, instead of saying that I'm gonna go pick you up from your like, you know, living room, they actually would say, no, you walk outside the community to the main gate and then we'll pick you up from the main gate or something like a, a, a reasonable spot on the route. So that way there's not enough, there's not too much detour for the main, uh, for the rider. And in uh, in those cases, the Express is actually super uh, powerful. So I, I, I went to India a couple of weeks ago and then I used to, I was just trying all of these things just to see how it works. The Uber Express is, is, uh, is fantastic because all I have to do is like, I, rather than wait for like 20 minutes for my Uber ride to arrive, I just have to walk 10 minutes and I'm almost always guaranteed a ride because essentially uh, I'm, I stay about 10-15 minutes away from the main trunk route. So it's, it's much easier for me to find that. Whereas if I actually look for a specific ride, then it becomes a lot harder. Even for me to get like a, a dedicated Uber cab is more expensive, more time consuming, in, in more expensive in terms of time than for me to get like a, a Uber pool or, or a Uber share or like, like Ola's other system, they have like a Ola share, I think. But it's actually pretty uh, pretty interesting. So, so great questions, what else? The other thought was uh, how, so I started 8, so like uh, I think Savage was already 7 and Shnik, so I want to reach by a certain time, so how much, so the delay that I want to have is what I have to look at before, saying that you know, if I pick up 5 people, I will reach later than Mm -hmm. Or I might just pick up four people or if everybody walks then it's easier for me to pick up all of them. Mm -hmm. yeah. So there's a lot of other variations and variations for getting to the algorithm. So fantastic. I mean same similar theme yeah. is what I've seen multiple folks discuss. What else? So that was the question that like, is the preference more towards the driver side that the driver should reach within this time? Or can the driver go out of his way and So the specifically the scoop system? As a, I've only taken it as a driver, not a rider yet, but uh, as a driver, it actually uh, it lets me pick the time I want to start and I usually say I want to start at 8.15 and that's it. Usually gives me a range, but I don't pick a range. I just say 8.15 to 8.15, that's it. Like whenever I want to start is when I want to start. And then uh, it usually gives me an opportunity to go pick somebody up uh, on the way and then, uh, and then drop them somewhere. And there is no, uh, the, the stupid thing here is that uh, it is always almost always a detour. Like you know, my route is from, from my place. I take a particular exit to get into the freeway, take a particular exit, then get out to work. Right. So invariably, what I have to do is I have to pick a different exit to get into the freeway because I have to go somewhere, pick somebody, and then go, which is usually like a five ten minute detour, not more. And when I drop somebody off, it's usually uh, like about a few miles away from work uh, where I am because like Amazon buildings are there are a few of them. So the the other person is working somewhere else, but the expectation is I drop them at their place of work. Not that I go to my place of work and they can walk from there. So yeah, yeah. when I do carpool, uh, but like when I'm, when I'm physically manually arranging for a carpool, I tell them like, hey, I'm going to drive to this building. Where's your office? Like yeah. you figure out where you're going from there. Like I'm not dropping in downtown. I'm not driving. Sorry. In Samavesh, I can drive like you know five miles to go pick you up because that's going to take me ten minutes at most. Whereas if I have to go like you know 500 meters to uh, like that's it. In downtown, that's going to take me half an hour to go figure out where the U-turn is and all that shit. So I don't want to do it. So I'm very picky about my pickup. Uh, I'm not picky about my pickup. I'm very picky about the drop. And my drop is I'm going to drop you at my office. That's it. You can do whatever you want to do after that. Whereas Scoop actually optimizes for the rider's uh, comfort, not the driver's comfort when it comes to pickup and destination. So at this point, that's what they're doing. Uh, I'm sure, at, uh, and this is reasonably new. I think I, I have started using it only now, but I think I saw this like about eight, nine months ago is when they started like going full throttle with this. I'm hoping that they learn from this and they probably switch things around and say, okay, we will optimize. On the other hand, on the in the evening commute, I don't care about where I drop them. I can drop them later. So my issue is Seattle, not Samarish. So it's not about pick up and drop. It's actually about the city. So they'll have to figure out how to actually optimize that. Destination for the morning. And destination for the morning and source for the for the evening for me because like I don't want I don't want to drive around in downtown at 5 p.m. It's gonna take me two hours to just navigate like four streets for no reason, right? And it's much easier for the person to just like walk across the street and then come and uh, grab the cab from wherever I am. So 
me going, I have to spend 30 minutes to go from, like, you know, two streets across to go wait for them. And if they're five minutes late, the cops going to ask me to go around the place another 30 minutes gone. So it's just all over the place. Fantastic. That's the other group. What did you guys discuss? So, yeah, we were talking about two things like uh, whenever the riders post the uh, starting and destination point at the same time, so, like, for suppose, like, three riders are posted at the same time, mm -hmm. how would that be matched with the passengers who are trying to? have the same starting and destination point mm -hmm. during the same time. So we were thinking like you can use the first come first serve basis like, mm -hmm. and apart from that we can also use the preferences. If they have some preferences like they need some uh, more luggage to be carried so by looking at the car type, so if, even they can have that preferences so that that could be matched. Mm -hmm. And also we were talking about the challenges here like for suppose if the rides are already confirmed and if the riders cancels the ride if we couldn't make that, if has some other work, so then all the five passengers who is trying to take them to the destination has to be distributed to the other uh, riders as well. Mm -hmm. So even then, it has to go to the... Find a way to actually uh, accommodate for that. So the way Scoop solves that problem is a good one. I actually was, uh, I wasn't expecting anyone to talk through that problem statement, but fantastic. So the way Scoop solves the problem is that if you, you may have unmatched riders, or you may have riders who are actually who, whom, on whom the driver has cancelled, right? So they actually have a concept of waitlist, and uh, they put people on the waitlist. And so me, as a as a driver who has not been matched, or I never I didn't bother putting in something uh, because I don't know when I'm leaving, and now I'm, it's five o'clock. I want to leave. I can actually go look up the waitlist and see who's nearby, and I can go choose. It's it's like here's John. He's like you know three minutes away from you in terms of pickup spot. He's actually ten minutes away from you in terms of like your destination and wants to leave between you know 5.15 and 5.20 or something like that and I can go say okay match me up with John right off the bat so I could do that and uh, and I've been for the last couple of days I've been just looking at the wait list just to see how it goes I see about five to ten people on the wait list every time so it's actually uh, so they have that's how they solve the problem and again uh, the, the interesting thing is that is to start looking at here are the problem statements and then this is how you're going to solve for it and if some if, if a rider bails out then what do you do can I reassign the, the person to different ones? The challenge with that is that uh, in a typical ride sharing system like a Uber, like on demand ride sharing system, there is an expectation that this happens like instantaneously. Whereas in a system like this, where it's offline, it's going to be a little, little difficult. So in the study group that I'm trying to match right now, if I and, and I'm trying to match two leads with six students, that's the that's the plan that I'm trying to do. That, that's the bash I'm trying to do. If two of my students bail out. Now what do I do? Right? I need to go look at the pool of other students and try to kind of backfill for this and make it work. Right? So, which I think I can do, uh, which is easier because I've got a bigger pool of students. What if two of my leads bail out? What do I do? Right? If, if one leads, so I have two leads. If one lead bails out, I might actually say, you know what? For this group, it's a little inefficient, but let's run with one lead. The whole idea of having two leads was to make it easier on the leads and you know learn from that and things like that. But what if I did it this way? It's not too, not super bad. But on the other hand. If I have quite a lot of leads bailing out, then I probably have to cancel groups, right? Because I can't do much. I mean, sorry, I wish I could, but there's not too much, uh, too much leverage that I have here. The only thing I can probably do is I can have the students actually run a group amongst themselves without a lead. In which case, I mean, it's a study group. So you should be able to help each other. It's not the best, but well, let's find out. Let's actually run that experiment and see what happens as well, right? I mean, I have, uh, uh, so, so basically there's some rudimentary uh, correction mechanisms that I have. So typically in most system design, most process engineering that you do, you know the happy case that works very well. It's actually these corner cases, exceptions, and how you handle the process is where the that's where the, uh, the the system gets more and more complicated. And usually trying to find like a simplistic solution for all of those things is is where where you win, right? So. So uh, I want to make another point. So we also discussed a little bit about process. Uh, we in the end we didn't have much time before it went over but we decided that we'll have some servers uh, which run the algorithm and say at the determined night time like 10 pm it will pull the data from the database to the processing mm -hmm. and put the results back into another database mm -hmm. and have the clients pull the information from there because the client timings might be different Correct. and so it does not make sense for the database I mean all the uh, servers running the algorithm service to push the data to the client. So we thought that it would be like a pull model. So that was also one of Works very well. Works very well. So essentially, uh, in in most of these cases, and I think we we talked about this as the uh, the Twitter feed system, right? 
uh, that's a, that's a, one, of the, one of the design questions we talked about is where you want to actually compute the, the rider's view up front. So once you have figured out what happens, all you need to do is to pre-cook the data yeah. and then send it and, and cache the information that the riders want to see up front. So that way, whenever you wake up, 4 o'clock or 10 o'clock, doesn't matter, you go and you look up the thing, you can see your view because your view is cached because that view doesn't change, right? Once once I have assigned you to rider 1 or driver 1, the driver, driver's and rider's view should be pre-computed and cached. So that's like a, a, a different strategy and that actually works very well for this kind of a system. So just at a very high level, from meta point standpoint, we are looking at input, which is like a, what, what are the different inputs that you're actually gathering from a rider, from the driver. And then you have like the process, we talked about different aspects of the process as well. We talked about output, which is the rider and driver pieces. The thing that we didn't talk much about, except probably for the exception scenario that we talked about here is, uh, and I think we talked, few pieces came out, was around the actions that you can perform after the, the match has happened. Like, you know, can I cancel? If I cancel, what do I do? Uh, what if I don't like it? What if something happens and my car is not working, car is not starting, how do I switch? And uh, there's also one uh, interesting thing that the scoop actually does is that it actually says that uh, uh, if, like as a driver when I go match, it says like if I'm not being matched as a rider, match me as a driver. Or if I'm not matched as a driver, match me as a rider. So like my role is actually not fixed and I don't mind which one is it and it lets me do that as well. So essentially it doesn't, uh, the decision tree doesn't start with you picking whether you're a driver or a rider, but you can actually say I prefer to be a rider but I don't mind being a driver or the other way around because in case they have too many of one, they can flip things around, which is which is which was interesting. So if you have two riders or drivers, then you can just match it a little better. I have a question. Um, I don't. I'm not sure if we discussed this. So I was trying to use this matching carpool system like a couple of days ago, and like drivers had this choice to say we just pick up like from the Redmond library. Mm -hmm. and just setting is based on, I mean, is it something that maybe makes a difference in the, uh, the system design, like if the drivers just can have this choice that say, no, we can pick up everywhere that riders are, it's okay for us, or no, we just pick up at like some... Specific. What do you think? What do you think? What do you think is that? So that, that, that is a fantastic feature to provide. And uh, as I was saying in the, in the previous example, I don't have, I don't care where I pick them up from in the morning but I care where I drop them. I don't want to drop them anywhere except this one spot because I don't want to be riding around in the downtown in the morning. At the same time, I don't care where I drop them in the evening. I can drop them in Issaquah, Sammamish, Redmond, Kirkland, doesn't matter where because that detail doesn't matter too much to me. But I really care where I pick them up. I don't want to pick them up even like half a mile away from where I am because it's just super painful for me to be riding in the downtown. So, so this constraint that we're talking about, how does it actually change? It's, it's, a, fan, it's a fantastic functionality. Uh, from a customer standpoint, you're thinking about the customer, I like that. Uh, what, how would it affect the design or how would it affect the complexity of the design that you're building? It's just so one more constraint on your system, right? Maybe just affect more on matching process. Mm -hmm. like, like, so if you go down the path of algorithm design, the KNN and whatever else, then yes, yeah. it kind of makes sense. But if you're... But otherwise, if I were to look at it in an abstract sense, it's like it's one more constraint, one more data point for me to deal with. Mm -hmm. But but it's it's a definitely a good um, good thing to good thing to look at. Um, so this this system, I think, it's a very simple question. There's not really a whole lot uh, a whole lot of uh, of things here. The the we didn't talk about a few different um, elements here. So one was I think uh, scale didn't come up much here because we looked at the process. I think it's it's okay. Uh, there's not much here. We didn't talk about much in terms of the UI, how is the customer going to pick, would you use a map or would you use like a, a, a address input, I mean what makes sense. Uh, depending on where the interviewer wants to take you, depending on the type of role you're applying to, if you're applying for like a, a, a sort of a UI designer for example, right, I mean they would, it will be heavily focused on the UI aspects of it but they will actually talk to the system design aspects, right, there are a lot more. Uh, we uh, did anyone get to the API here in terms of like what would be the driver API and what would be the rider API? Not really, right? We didn't get to that that point. So uh, again, the thing is that uh, an interviewer will guide you towards that. So if I were in, in an interview and my goal was to actually understand your ability to design system APIs, and then I would actually walk to this and say, tell me what are the functions and functionality, like what, what can a driver do, what can a rider do, and then define the API. So in terms of the API, what do you think the API looks like for the rider? 
what is the rider api in this case so he would provide information like uh, where his uh, location is and at what timings he wants to uh, find a driver for mm -hmm. i think um, that's it so, so we are yeah. It, yeah. it would be probably like push data, pull data, mm -hmm. and then uh, accept okay. or reject. Fair enough. Uh, I'm, still, I'm, I'm waiting for one buzzword that has not come yet. So uh, whatever entities will be fine, right? Okay, that was one of the buzzwords also. Okay, for we can directly. What is the entity? So we said that oh, these are all the information we want to register for the driver. Mm -hmm. There's no. So driver is an entity. Then. Okay. Driver's data, like metadata, is, is sort of like metadata for that okay. driver entity. And then there are right. So, so the ride is the entity, entity or the trip or the trip preference yeah. is an entity and then essentially you're trying to match the trip preference right so you, your goal here is that you're not trying to match the rider and the driver you're matching the rider's trip to the driver's yes. trip there's a little bit of a difference i mean in the, even though in physical terms it looks like i am matching with you it's not like my ride is being matched with your ride so the, the entity we're trying to match is our respective ride and so that's not really an api it's just a data model so the so the, in, 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 if you model it in a restful way, then what you're trying to do is that my trip preference is something that I go update. So I can see what my trip preference is. I can create my trip. I can post a trip preference. I can delete a trip preference because if I don't want to cancel the ride, I write preference at this point. Then write preference gets mapped into a ride. And that ride is a shared entity between you and I. Because we both have access to view the ride. And I can see, you know, oh, you're my driver. And I can see that, hey, you're also picking this guy up. So I can see the entire ride information and I can choose to cancel that, which is essentially, I can't uh, delete the ride because I'm just a rider. I can withdraw from the ride, which means I can remove myself from the ride. And you as a driver can actually delete the entire ride, in which case it will spawn off other things. So there's a bunch of, of items that you can actually uh, model as APIs. And that is uh, that API design is nothing but a, a very solid, like you know, structured representation of everything we just discussed in terms of process. That's all that is, and clearly defining this is the this is like the the entity model. Here's this data belongs to this entity. This is a relationship, and and, and so on. So that we didn't. I, I was actually hoping that one of us in this group would have actually kind of like let me define the API and then go with it. Uh, that didn't happen. So that that is fine. But an interviewer would nudge you towards that, and then you would be expected to build that. You had a question. Uh, yeah, I just want to know from the APIs standpoint, uh, what kind of The ride as in once the ride is once the ride is built or before the ride is built. Um, I'm assuming for now I was thinking once the ride is built. Once the ride is built. Uh, so repeat the question. So once the ride is set up. So he is a driver. We two are riders, right? Yeah. That information is there as a part of the ride. Yeah. Starting time is there. Location is there. Pickup point is there and whatnot. So at some point, theoretically, somebody else could have a telemetry system which is actually monitoring his GPS, my GPS, his GPS, figuring out whether it, he really drove at which, what point of time, when did he pick me up, when did he pick him up, when did he drop him, when did he drop him, like, you know, all of that, right? So there is a ride object which represents the expectation in terms of what the ride should be. And then there is probably telemetry which is capturing the data and comparing it. What is your question in terms of what so, is the ride? Uh, uh, Go for it. No, uh, take take a step so into the details. I'm just thinking is where um, all of these APIs um, sort of um, have a core um, GIS kind of a system, mm -hmm. uh, which actually maps the rides onto that. Mm -hmm. um, so would it take information from that core GIS system, which would say that um, a ride would have a source at this? GPS mm -hmm. um, and then the destination would be so and so GPS. Mm -hmm. um, and then when we want to add um, another member to that ride, um, how does that take place? Okay. So, uh, one of the things in this is that rides are immutable in yeah. the sense that it can be cancelled but cannot be modified. Yeah. So, the, and there's no concept of even like as a passenger, I can't, it doesn't even let me withdraw. Okay, so what it lets me do is it lets me message the driver and say, dude, I'm not driving. It doesn't let me withdraw. So the driver can actually do whatever they want. It's like once the pairing is done, the driver can choose not to pick me up and continue. But then they're expecting the driver to manage. That's how I believe Spook works. I, as a rider, I've not seen the interface enough to know. 
but that's one thing. But back to the question of whether it will be integrated with the GIS system to figure something out or to add or delete is uh, the way I am looking at it at a very simplistic level is I'm just looking at the ride as a as an object which contains one driver and a set of riders. And at this point I'm saying a set because I know that scoop matches me with two riders at times. So I, I'm assuming it's multiple. It's not just two riders, not just one. So there are, I'm assuming that it lets you, it may match maybe up to three because a typical car can house four people, hold four people, right? So maybe it does that. On the other hand, um, uh, in terms of like the address is important because it, it's just data and the uh, ride matching system uses the address to figure out the distance and the proximity but the ride object itself does not have, in and of itself does not care about the GIS system. In fact, uh, Scoop app does not even do any routing or matching or anything. If I were to say map my ride, all it does is that it opens up Google Maps with my starting location, my first pickup, my second pickup, my first drop, my second drop and my destination, that's it. So it does the, it just opens Google Maps with that uh, five different, six different addresses or something like that. So it's 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 kind of like you know, hands off. I am not telling you where to go. Whereas if you look at Uber and and Lyft and other things, they actually prescribe a route, which is also crowdsourced from, it's also like sourced from Google or uh, Bing Maps or something. I mean, different apps are probably contracted to different companies, but they have like a Uber branded interface or Lyft branded interface, which is what they use and. If the driver strays too far away from the path, then they actually have like you know fines or penalties or something because the driver in, in Uber scenario the customer pays on a on a per mile basis and per minute basis. In a scoop case, they actually pay on a per ride basis. So there is no incentive for you as a driver to go take me through a, like a, a scenic route if you want to. <laughs> right? A tour of the city doesn't really help. So yeah, fantastic. So I know I, I originally had planned for two questions, but uh, given how far we've, we've come along with one, it's, it's a little hard. What I'll do is, I'll, uh, so any questions on this one? Because I also want to like leave you with uh, with the with the API design question because we didn't do API. Design. So one thing in our discussion came up is see, we store this data in a plot table, right? Mm -hmm. When somebody registered a tree, mm -hmm. but those doesn't match with the algorithm. So like the finding the nearest rider for the driver. Mm -hmm. Uh, there's no way to figure out that from the pure coordinates. Mm -hmm. So the way uh, that's I where the GIS comes in handy, right? You need to so the the ride the, the trip matching has to essentially like um, you, there's one more level of clarity that you need. There's one more function you need to apply on top of just the coordinates before you can get to like how do you, how do you uh, so what I what I try to apply? I'm not sure whether it is okay or not, but the I know how Uber solves this problem by uh, building the quad grid, mm -hmm. so that you tra travel from one direction to other. Nearest table is always, you know, you just travel from your point to the left or right little bit, and then you find all the nearest neighbor, and then you figure out the distance. Because mm -hmm. if there are like ten thousand riders, uh, I can't find the. You can't find route. Everyone trying to map the route to everyone doesn't make sense. So right? you can find out oh from. Where I am, or oh, these are ten nearest uh, rider. Uh, let me see if that destination match. Not then find another ten that matches with my search criteria. Find that destination is match. Mm -hmm. So let me ask you: what, what what is the cost of uh, what is the cost of of missing a match? Like for whatever reason, you and I are like perfect matches. Like you know, you are my my next door neighbor for some reason, and then uh, and then we are going to the exact same destination or not? Right? That's a perfect match. We should have been matched. Hmm. What's the cost of not matching? Not, not much. Like instead of you who's like 5 feet away, it matches me with him who's like 20 feet away. What's the problem? Nothing. So instead of him going matchless, which would have probably happened if only you are the only two riders and I'm the only driver. Mm -hmm. So, and we're supposed to like say, mess with one of you. Instead of him, it's messing with you. That's it, right? You're, you're being dropped and you don't have a ride this time. It doesn't make a difference. So the cost of not matching a rider, like even in Uber scenario, right? The fact that like if there are 10 drivers and you are trying to say I want to give me a give me a match, there is one driver who's like five minutes away, another driver who's like seven minutes away. What's the harm if the Uber system matches you with a driver who's seven minutes away? It's not efficient, yeah. but it doesn't matter in the in the in the grand scheme of things, it's probably okay. So Uber and Lyft and others, they would pick a, a slightly less efficient path because of their imprecise algorithms. And the same thing happens even in like Amazon warehousing systems, right? If I actually were to pick 
uh, a warehouse to ship you a product, I want to pick the cheapest warehouse to ship you the product from. Now, if I were to, or cheapest and the fastest way to get you there. If I, if, my, if I were to actually go figure out like all the thousand places where the product is, and then try to figure out the cost for like from A to B, I'm looking at an N square kind of an algorithm, and that's like ridiculously complicated. So instead, what I would do is I'd use some kind of a heuristic and say that for all people in the West zone, I'm going to try to use the West zone. Chances are that the West zone is going to be more cost effective. And then I'm going to only, now I'm performing a much smaller comparison. And then you assign people to their nearest warehouses. If it doesn't work there, then I'm going to pick one warehouse from the regional, if not the national or something like that. So with that kind of a stepped algorithm, you're saving a lot of uh, computation. And uh, what's the harm? Worst case, I'll end up shipping you like a few products, which is like, you know, 10 cents more expensive. So be it, right? I mean, I can further optimize, but uh, this is good enough in some cases. Okay, yeah. So it's uh, something similar in algorithm. So, but my question was, so this, Static data, what we captured is totally different than the algorithm what it's required. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, you can't... Uh, Give me an example of what the algorithm requires. So, what, what, does algorithm what, what I know is that uh, for Uber, they build a quad tree out of the data. Mm -hmm. And then whenever the system comes up, it builds a quad tree. Mm -hmm. so, so, that's what you would need to do here as well. Is that is an algorithm. Or yeah. you're using KNN, for example. Yeah, I'm not sure if KNN is going to work that I, I don't know but K I'm, would be the K nearest neighbors right yeah so but then it's just it a clustering is, algorithm yeah it is as okay uh, maybe it's just a simple clustering algorithm so if you know what KNN is or if you can figure out what the, the it is very easy to represent the kind of data that we're talking about in as an input to the KNN but I don't know KNN I thought well, my understanding of KNN works in one dimension exactly. I don't know whether it matches source and destination at the same yeah, time yeah, I yeah. know how to match sources So that extremes. Mm -hmm. So I don't know how that works. So I, I, I don't know enough about the algorithm to know. But all I know is that I, I looked at KNN so for a different problem statement and my understanding is very rudimentary. Okay, so KNN also that means that is a special data structure or all. It, it needs like some kind of yeah. uh, organization of data for it to be effective. Okay. But I don't know if it's directly applicable to this problem statement it take because it I thought it only clusters based on some metrics. And I thought you could do it by either source or the destination, but not both. Or maybe there's a different algorithm to do it both, for both. But anyway, let's not dive into the so, KNN and algorithm per se. But so my static data is different, and then say that this is different. So we, the data you need, system, yeah. So the time you need and store is whatever system, right? The data you need and store is based on uh, simple, simple yeah. inputs, and uh, and and how do you how do you capture the data from the customers? How do you they can edit the preference? Like for example, the start time and end time. I can edit it till 9 p.m. I can keep adding, editing, and whatnot. Once the data, once it's 9 p.m., right, I'm done. I can't edit anymore. So at that point of time, I'm assuming that they take that data and transform it into whatever that is required as inputs for the algorithm. And then they run the algorithm on top of it. And once I'm done with that, there is nothing I can do, right? I mean, I can't go back and say, oh, you know what, oops, I changed my mind. I want to leave at 8 a.m. I can't do that anymore. Once I, once it's 9 p.m., data is done. I can't edit anymore. So that's how Scoop is running the running the show. So I'm assuming that they are actually taking the raw data and they're cooking it to whatever is helpful for the process. Question? So, uh, we also mentioned this was like scheduled kind of thing, like before, like just before 9 p.m. there's, uh, you need to do all your scheduling at 9 p.m. we do the cutoff. So, sh should we also speak about the fact that how long it takes after scheduling the match happens and the complexity for the systems is fine? So, I think like telling that so we'll scale for the, the from nine to ten o'clock. We'll scale the system because we want to do all the matching and stuff, and then we we'll scale down the system. Is mm -hmm. that something that we touched upon? Interesting. So this is more around like you know you need a lot more compute power for the for the one hour after this thing, and then you don't need enough compute after that, right? Because the process is a very short-lived process. Mm -hmm. So theoretically, you could use like an Azure or an AWS system where you're spinning up instances which run the algorithm and then you shut it down. You don't need it for the whole time. So this is not something that was super common like about like a decade ago, where uh, the computer cloud computing and, and uh, renting computers by the minute or by the hour was not very prevalent. And now that we have these capabilities, I think it's a, it's, it's a fantastic uh, thing to come up with and actually say that, hey, I, I recognize the fact that you are very compute intensive for a very short burst, and uh, which essentially means that I can actually easily think of this as a, as a cloud-based computing system where I can just outsource this compute externally and, and bring it back. So, it's a good observation to make, and uh, that could spawn off interesting discussions and discussion threads. So, 
let me uh, i think given we have about 10 minutes uh, about 5 minutes so let me take 5 minutes to explain like a question and we may not we may not actually get time to solve it let me just leave you with a question and then uh, and then uh, we'll figure out what it is right so i was actually intrigued by the rock paper scissors uh, question that was there so uh, how would you build an api which actually plays like you know helps you play rock paper scissors with anybody it was like without know, if i if i'm looking at this as like a it's uh, it's a system that lets me play the game of rock paper scissors with anybody else in the world right how would you how would you design the system how would you model this system? and i'm just looking at api design so one is user register say that i want to play then mm -hmm. the system match with another user who register so that i also want to play and is online so let me actually take take a little bit of that. So you actually would say you go to the system and you would say, I want to play rock paper scissors, mm -hmm. okay? And it'll say wait, matching you with another player who wants to play, yeah. and you wait. If there is not enough players, you will wait forever, okay? Another guy who comes and says I want to play, now the two of you are matched, all right? Mm -hmm. Now when you are matched, it'll actually show you an interface where you're supposed to pick rock paper scissors. You show show the other person rock paper scissors, and then you click, or both of you click. And then it will say, "Hey, he won or she won or whatever, right?" So that's what that's what it looks like. So that's all I'm trying to play. So what what all do you need? How complicated is this? And I want this to like this is this is like the uh, world rock paper scissors championship or something like that, all right? So we care about showing the data and stuff from all the. I want to show metrics, right? I want to show how many games you won. I want to show how many games you lost. I want to throw a show, uh, you know, keep track of, like, you know, whether you're throwing more rocks, more papers, more scissors. Uh, what's your pattern? Like, do you throw ten rocks and one scissors? Like, I want to know all of that. Do we have any limit? After they are matched, we both play equal. Say that again. Do we have any limit? After the game, like the the game limit between two people, like two people can only play like. 50 games at one time, at one connection. After 50 games, they have to lock, they have to build, they have to lock out of that game to join the game. No, no restrictions. And, and there is no, uh, yeah, no restrictions at this point of time. But you might want to throttle some users if they are trying to bring down the system. You cannot play multiple games simultaneously. You are only playing one game at a time. So, there is no throttle, right? No, you, they may not play, but they might continuously keep playing and then uh, uh, like uh, maybe create multiple fake accounts or something from the same computer and try to mm -hmm. open the system. Like so, the fair enough, but it doesn't change. I'm, I'm trying to understand so why. So you may not probably throttle based on user account, but based on the server load, you might want to expand the number of servers or throttle the request down. Okay. And say yeah, we are going in downtime. Fair enough. There are some some elements of scale and throttling here. Uh, 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 how how many like you know do you know that a game does not always have to win in the win or lose, right? Yeah. The game does not always result in a victory or a defeat. It is also a draw. Right? So what happens when there is a tie? Do you match the new guy or uh, do you actually... Uh, yeah. It's a series of games, right? And the game session uh, it stores points. So you could use the traditional 0, 1, 3 system. You have one point for draw and three points for win. Mm -hmm. um, and then you just pass on that use and it goes, uh, the API just updates the user score um, as they keep winning. Sure. So the, the thing is, fair enough, I like that what you're saying. So a couple of things in terms of what is not clear and where, I, where you need to start clarifying this is that, so very clearly each interaction, each encounter is very clear, right? The encounter is between one throw. Like I throw a rock or a paper or a scissors and you do the same and then we know how to, we know what the result looks like. That's like one one thing, right? So we understand that. But then now the rules are not clear in terms of like that's what I need to clarify in terms of the API and the modeling is so so you can easily model that one throw as an API. That's very straightforward. And uh, there's still some nuances there, but you can do that. But what needs to happen is like uh, is a game just one throw? Or is it like a, a set of 10? Like, you know, you play like 11 part series or something like that. Like, you know, you play 11 games, rock, paper is like best of 3, best of 5, best of 11, right? That's, that's or points. Or the game is as long as the user chooses to play with the other player. Oh, yeah. That too. It's a set of 5, set of 7, set of 10. Yeah, you usually go up front happen, because... Right? They can play 50, 100 or... No, what, what, if, I, what if I do the first rock, paper, and scissors, and then I'm like, no, I don't want to play anymore because I won. 
then I go, I lose. Now I continue playing till I am actually the moment I am in lead, I'm just gonna back out. But the, the the meeting of the mind has to happen from both parties. I think right? that's fair. That's the same with gambling also. You choose to play the next game. Gambling is actually against the house, not with each other. And if you do it with each other, then if you want to always back out when you're losing and not when you're winning, or uh, like the other way around, you want to back out when you're winning and not when you're losing, that's not yeah. not. It's not fine, right? Like in chess. Mm -hmm. Okay, it is not best of your five. You play one game. Mm -hmm. If you dis you can uh, actually forfeit the game in the middle also. So that I'm going as in that case they'll register as a lose loss for you. Or you can keep playing, you know, as much as you want. Now so there is a so please define the scoring system. The, yeah. the one that he was talking about in terms of scores is yeah. that every win is three points, every draw is one point, every yeah. loss is zero points. Mm -hmm. Now you can stop at one game, you can stop at ten, you can stop at hundred, doesn't matter. Yeah. Because you can choose any time, like, you know, and because it's not about you're not getting anything by if you win three times against me in a row, it doesn't mean anything. Whether you lose against me afterwards or you lose against somebody else afterwards is irrelevant. Mm -hmm. So at that time, your score is just based on 0, 1, 3 model, and then that way each game is independent and you can just choose to do whatever and you can continue. Or instead of 0, 1, 3, you keep plus 1, minus 1. Or plus or minus. Same thing, it's just a So you're not incrementing it by plus 2, right? Like a win is having more work. So you sure. might want to lose. Uh, sure. Game. I mean, it's, it's just just math there, but it's fine. Fair enough. Yeah. Uh, understood. So so that makes sense. Now the the thing to uh, also figure out is like the matching algorithm. Matching algorithm is pretty symmetric in this case, right? It's very simple. Like you know, go uh, if if I want to play, I said I want to play, and then you just want to pick somebody else to play with, and you're good to go, right? There's nothing nothing complicated. So pretty straightforward. Scoring is pretty straightforward, right? Now uh, the thing is that. Uh, uh, um, how do you actually deal with uh, with with like item portals? How many item portals? Like how many votes can I actually have for a single game? How many throws can I have for a single game? Uh, as much as you want, so we store game state. Uh -huh. uh, which for a single game, if I say I throw rock, paper, no wait, scissors, yeah, but rock or something like that, right? You can change it whenever you want uh -huh. until the state of the game changes. Uh -huh. It seems so like when the game decides to execute and say that we're coming up with a decision, it is no longer a whatever it is. So you can change your decision till the state changes. Once the state is changing, once the state changes to play or whatever. How do you figure out, so I said like, hey, I'm, I'm going to throw a rock. No, paper, right? No, no, it says this, right? I'm, I'm doing this. How do you know which one you're going to retain? The, the, the last, last one? Yeah. And How what if you get the message in a different order? That's why I See, now we are complicating the design of the system a little. So essentially, what I'm saying is, the one is you can say no. You give me one, and that's it. I'll take the first one you give me. The first one I listen is is, is it, and I'll ignore everything else. If you actually give me two of them, two votes, like if you say rock, no, and it's scissors, I didn't get rock. I didn't hear rock at all. So I heard scissors. I'm gonna pick one, and I'm gonna stop everything else. So essentially, what I'm saying is. Depending on my network conditions, depending on my processing speed, I may choose to pick any one of your thing, and I will ignore the rest. And uh, and that's that's it. You, you should only you should have chosen wiser, is what I could say. But go on. But shouldn't you guarantee item potency in this kind of situation? Because it's like a tournament, and you're choosing what you want to. Because if you pick random ones, mm -hmm. like based on the order of what we think we are getting. Mm -hmm. That's unfair for the player because they chose something. So you can. But they shouldn't have changed their minds in the first place. Yeah, okay. So yeah, yeah, yeah. you have you should have picked one. The fact that you picked two, I'm, all I'm saying is that I can choose any one. I mean, I, 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 you said like uh, instead of let's assume that it's instead of rock paper scissors, it was like heads or tails, right? I'm tossing a coin and it's supposed to call heads or tails. You said like tails and I tossed the coin. You said no, I changed my mind. Heads. I didn't hear you. So I'm saying hey, I, I, all I know is you called tails. That's all I know, right? And that's all, that's all stands and that's all I'm going to verify against. Oh, or you know what, I actually heard you say, I changed my mind. So that's what I'm going to hold on to. So why not have like a time-based thing, like you have like two seconds to make a decision, as soon as you make a decision, the last one you just made is the one which you have. How do you know that's the last one? What if the last why message comes before the second last message? Why choices, right? Like, why one second, what? let me answer this question. The messages are never in order, especially in a distributed system, where you, you cannot guarantee the order of processing. Unless you code so that you somewhere. You hold it on the client side, right? You, you don't send it until the two seconds yeah, so happens. Yeah, I understand what you're saying. You no, say that you define a game state yeah. just on the client side. So you say. So you can change your mind anytime you want, yeah, and then you tell the server once and you're good to go. Yeah. Yeah. In yeah. real rock, paper, scissors, you can't change your decision yeah. after the fact. So yeah, I don't know why we'd like to. <laughs> uh, yeah, I was about to say that, you know, you can 
make as many decisions in your mind as much as you want. But, but once you know, so, so you know, in this game also, user can think whatever he want. But Fair. once he register, it is done. Why do you want to allow him to change it? Fair. He, I mean, fair. So I have one question. So he makes a choice. And then we are setting the request to the server, and the user refreshes the page. What happens then? The session is lost. Uh, you can always preserve things, right? There are, there are enough ways to preserve sessions. So why is it so sessions. difficult? Like as soon as the user may, makes a choice, why can't we disable the UI? So the only way they can get out of it and make a new choice is by refreshing the page. So if you say, if we say by refreshing the page or logging out of the game, then there are no other options. So restricting something like this at the UI level is actually uh, is is opening yourself to. I abuse. think it has to be done it's all abuse. the time, but it's at not a problem for the server. I think it's a problem for the. You server. need to have a, you need to have a, a philosophy for the server as to how you deal with it. If if it's like you know first one wins, or the last one wins, or something else, and then you can use a client to make sure that the logic is actually cleaner. And moreover, if we have a TCP connection, it's guaranteed that the messages should be in order that the session will be gone. Yeah. Messages can come and you're only guaranteeing the, the, the arrival at the server's So the packets doorstep. are going to come in order, how can the messages go out of order? You're only guaranteeing it till the doorstep of the server, right? It's a distributed system, so which means that uh, I, I, I could have multiple endpoints, I could have multiple servers which are actually running or uh, processing messages. So you're saying you will have multiple endpoints answer the same request? from another client? Not but the same request. I could be routing the message to different the, servers. The socket is like the two endpoints. It cannot be like my main, a, one to many. If I, if I were to design in any meaningful way, I would actually take the incoming request and put it in, in some sort of a priority, like a, a queue system, and I'd be consuming the queue from the other side. So yeah, you don't control the, server the, to, client to server might be yeah cleaner, that is on the top but layer. server to server processing could actually make the there, there's enough algorithms or enough structures you can use where that will actually flip itself it's assume the worst it will happen so if it happens then what do you do come up with a philosophy all right so I know we are one minute over so uh, the other thing that I just want one more variation that I wanted to bring up in this one was that what if I actually wanted to build like a tournament structure so what I'm saying is there's an off paper scissors tournament and I'm actually waiting for like you know 16 players to show up mm. before I, I assemble a tournament. So I wait, I get a, a set of 16 players and then I build the tournament tree. I'm saying like two, 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 two pairs, whoever wins, I just promote them up and then I, I do that and I keep promoting them up and then you win your, your branch but then you're waiting for the other branch to complete because people could be doing rock, paper, scissors multiple times because you can keep doing it till one of them has to win or something like that, right? So how do you decide, uh, how do you define an API for that setup where you're actually trying to build a, a rock, paper, scissors tournament where the server is waiting for n number of players, like a, a power of two for simplicity and then you're just like, you know, building, playing that many number of games and then you're just assembling it uh, all the way up, right? So, so why this? Is this is what is saying that you use like you are actually now composing your game like a tournament is composed of games, game is composed of like a throw, and and things like that. So you are actually trying to structurally step into different forms of like you know you are combining different APIs and building a, an Uber API by orchestrating the API calls. So uh, or like uh, letting the clients orchestrate the calls for you. So anyway, so that's what I had. So what we'll do is we'll stop here. Uh, for folks who have not signed up for the study group yet, uh, I, either as leads or as students, please highly, highly encourage you to do that. It is essentially, uh, the, the URL is, is uh, sdskills.com slash it is sgleads, sgleads I think, and uh, sgstudent. All lowercase. Uh, can you check if it's plural leads? I think it is plural. Uh, it is on our Facebook. It's SG, SG student for sure. I think it's SG leads plural. I just so what do you guys do in the study group? Well, we uh, so the first study group is uh, is actually for taking people from basic uh, data structures to intermediate in the data structures. So we have a set of twelve questions that we want them to cover. We will cover these 12 questions in three weeks, one hour each week, four questions in each session. The leads, so the questions will be shared with the student like the week prior. Students are expected to solve the questions and then come to uh, an in-person or online meetup for, for one hour 
where we will discuss the questions, like 15 minutes per question, we will walk through, we will solve, we will correct your, uh, evaluate your solution, compare, cross compare and what not and then discuss. And then... Um, so should we submit or... Um, yes, the, the setup is something that, so there is a, I will set up something uh, next week as a, as a orientation for both the leads and the, and the thing for whoever else is in the short list of, of the group. And then uh, there is also a test at the end of the process. So three weeks of, uh, of classes and then uh, three classes and then one uh, fourth class is essentially a test. So that's the plan. Both are two. Both are two. All right. Thank you. SG students and SG leads. So. so. It works. Both work. Both work. That won't work. I'm pretty sure I only set up one redirect route, not two. SG students work for me. Student, it's singular, right? Yeah. Singular. Thank you. Singular. How many students here? Okay. Five. Singular. Let's go with it. Because I remember it as singular. And leads is leads. All right. If not, try both, please. That's okay. I mean, it doesn't hurt. Say it again? Next week, do we have meetups? Yes, we do have meetups. Uh, we, we have a meetup. We haven't decided what the topic is yet. I haven't, uh, we'll work through that to figure out. So, so, uh, so, till so far, we did the tracking the coding interview, so it was so much easier. Now it's a little, uh, so now I need to figure out what we're trying to do next week. Uh, most likely, we'll end up uh, like starting with coding sessions. Okay? All right, so see you guys uh, next week, and uh, please sign up for the Slack and the online. All right, thank you. Yeah, so uh,